Moving away from that, over the past uh, several weeks, we've directed our search, you know, looking for logical explanations and understanding, and we followed two distinct paths. One path, we looked at the origin of the writings that we study, that we call the Bible, that we call mythology, and we're trying at the same time to find a connection between those who may have authored these ancient writings, who wrote these things, and remember the number 4555. And being very engrossed in that number since it came out of the Coptic school, uh, which was the Greek schools in Egypt, uh, you know, the fact that so many brilliant minds assembled together at a time when there was not a great deal of brilliance running loose on the, on, the, on the planet Earth. All of it seemed to come together with these strange people, Diogenes, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, Pythagoras, and all of these, Democrates, and all of these people together just all of a sudden appeared and started providing the world with a foundation for civilization and science and medicine. And, you know, it was very strange to me. Then, then, of course, finding out that they wrote the Bible, and they did. They wrote the Bible. And even in the Old Testament, their influence is so strong because of the Jews that were in Egypt at the time who were writing this thing. Most of them were in the Hellenistic part, which was the Greek part as well. So their influence in the Bible, in, in the medical dictionaries, most of the words are Greek or Latin or whatever. And, you know, how, who were they? And then the find that they gave us this number 4555 led me to say, well, we can um, maybe consider the possibility that the people who we call the classic Greek minds, these brilliant minds, were possibly from 4555. They instructed us well, they provided us with the basis of our civilization in mathematics, science, astronomy, philosophy, etc. And who taught them. There was nobody here to teach them. The second part of our search that we've, um, we went through over the past few weeks was to find if we could find a logical explanation for how prayer and meditation work. Was there a logic involved in that? And, and then we found an amazing fact that when an electron or a photon or an atom is observed, its wave function as it travels through the universe collapses down to a particle just by observing it. We found that that's what goes on in laboratories, that uh, the scientists will send out a photon that moves in a wave function, but as soon as somebody observes it, bang, it reduces itself to a particle, and that particle then finds its way to where it's supposed to go. And, and of course, we use the words of, of great physicists and scientists and saying, of course, inside of the human body, you are all made up of photons, electrons, atoms. And so then the same thing occurs. So then when you pray, when you either turn within yourself and pray or you turn within yourself in meditation, you're actually making something powerful and scientific occur, and that is the wave function inside of you collapses to a, a particle when you watch, when you meditate. So the power of prayer and the power of meditation becomes self-evident, scientifically provable, that that observation that you make inside of yourself causes something to occur. And we went into a lot of depth about the workings of these things, that they can be pushed forward as you can send energy to another person or prayer to another person. They can be pulled as, as you receive that energy from God. And so, you know, this was a very, very significant consideration. We had two things that I think were significant. Number one, to identify those who wrote the ancient words. And number two, to show scientific proof of the results that can occur by human participation in the subatomic world. And I mean human participation in the subatomic world by observa observation, by meditating, by watching. As Jesus said in the Bible, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. 
And so those were the those were the, the, the two the two very very powerful things, the sub well that's the end of that one, the subatomic world of photons and electrons and so forth that are inside of us, and their connection to prayer and, and meditation, uh, you know it was a, an extremely significant thing that we were able to to put together. Now. Those two things we, we were able to do. That's what we've been doing over the last past several weeks. And I think if you can take scientifically and prove how prayer or meditation works, scientifically prove it, with not using any Bibles, not using any religious people, not using any New Age stuff, but prove it through science, that's a significant accomplishment. And I think that's what we've been able to do. And we have the benefit of people like Stephen Hawking and, and renowned scientists of the world who say indeed inside of us are the same things that are in laboratories and so the same thing would have to happen if someone observed inside of us as it happens in a laboratory. You change the context of that electron. Um, I wanted to pause for a moment though and just change the subject uh, after we've just reviewed that's what we've been doing and try to clarify some things. I received an email from a person who was concerned because he had heard or had studied that Jesus was the representative of the fish and was actually the representative of the age of Pisces. And yet it was Jesus who pointed to the man with the pitcher of water, symbolically seeming to say, you know, look for the man with the pitcher of water for the Passover, and which would then seem to indicate Pisces was pointing to Aquarius. Say. But the question was, how could we say Jesus was Pisces pointing to the coming of Aquarius when Aquarius comes before Pisces? Pisces is the last sign. So he would have had to have been pointing to Pisces. So this was a question. But all questions are very interesting and all questions are relevant. It's like Dieter asked a question, and I haven't seen him in a couple of weeks because he's been away on business. And, and, uh, what was that question that you asked about, um, I'm drawing a blank, you drawing a blank on it too? Okay. Well, it was uh, it, it was a good it was a very good question, and I drew a blank. So, I, but I brought in the documentation, the scientific documentation, to show you, and I'll think of it later when you know I don't have to. So we'll get to that. Um, but but let's look 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 in in the in the traditional astrological charts that we use traditional astrology, Pisces does follow Aquarius. Aquarius is the 11th sign, Pisces is the 12th sign. And, you know, the traditional astrological signs move from Aries, it starts at Aries and goes around and through Pisces and back to Aries again. But when you search through the various ages, then you're into something different. You're not into the month-by-month -month type of what sign does the sun appear to be in. You're into what's called the precession of the equinoxes. It's a different thing. So you have two, you have two things here. You have the monthly thing in which the sun goes through each of the 12 signs. And then you have the ages, which is connected and called the precession of the equinoxes, and it's a different thing, say. So there are two forms that we have to consider. The apparent movement of the sun through the 12 houses, in which case Aquarius is before Pisces, okay? So in other words, you get to Aquarius, now the next month is going to be Pisces. But then you have the other thing, the procession of the equinoxes, which we will look at in a minute. But in that event, Pisces comes before Aquarius. We have left the age of Pisces and we're entering the age of Aquarius. So indeed, Jesus did represent the fish in the end of the age of Pisces, and did point to the man with the pitcher of water, and then clarify that saying that the coming of the age of Aquarius. So. That's what it was, though. It was about Pluto. What is it? Peter's question was about Pluto. How could it be applied? That's right. That's right. Uh, you, you asked about Pluto and Hades. Uh, just real quick, and I'll, and I'll get to the information. But Hades in the ancient Greek was also known as the god Pluto or Pluton. Okay, and then when they discovered that planet, that was the most distant planet, they called it Pluto in 1930. 
1978, another guy came along, discovered the satellite around it, and called it Charon, which fulfilled what was in the Greek uh, ancient myth. But I'm going to have that for you. But that was a good question. OK. Uh, now, traditional astrology, as I said, starts at Aries and goes around uh, through Pisces, which is the final sign. But the ways of the ancients moved in different patterns. And this is what a lot of people who work in astrology have to be cognizant of when they get into biblical things, and when you get into start talking about the ancient Greeks and Egyptians and so forth and so on. The pattern that is found in the ancient documents always begins at the virgin and ends at the lion. It never starts at the ram and ends at the fish. It starts at the virgin and ends at the lion. And that is the riddle of the Sphinx. And that means virgin consciousness, purity, and then fulfillment, Christ consciousness, crystal consciousness, lion consciousness. The word Sphinx means to bind closely together. And obviously it was to show how the great heavenly circle came together, which the Sphinx was the head of the woman and the body of the lion. In the temple, you might want to, if you're interested in uh, looking at things, but there is a temple in Egypt called Esna, E-S-N-E-H. The signs of the lion Leo and the virgin Virgo are displayed on a wall. There's one here and there's one there. In between the two of them is the Sphinx carved into the wall. This is thousands of years ago. So in all astrological positioning attached to the Bible and to the ancient Greeks and Egyptians, the movement is from divine mind or virgin mind in meditation to Christ consciousness. So it's from Virgo to the line. And so then you follow the apparent trajectory of the sun, which is, of course, the movement of the earth, through the signs, and what do you see? You, you, you see what we've talked about for so long here. September, which is the month of the Virgin, there's the birth of the sun, Virgo, born between the horse and the goat, between Sagittarius and Capricorn, thus in a stable. Of course, that's where the horse and the goat are. And then November and December, then crucified on the crooks, or the cross, which is the southern cross, on December 21st, which is the shortest day of the year. Then three days and three nights in the tomb of the winter solstice, which is December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And then reborn traditionally at the end of the solstice on December the 25th. Then 30 years after his birth, Jesus steps into the water of the water man, John. And 30 days after December 25th, the sun enters the sign of the waterman Aquarius. Now you have in, in, in that movement that this lady in the email was questioning, the sun then moves into Pisces, and then Jesus leaves the water and selects his disciples from among the fishermen, which is the fish Pisces. The sun then moves into Aries, which is the ram or the lamb of God, which takes away the winter and brings us the spring. Jesus becomes the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Finally, Jesus rises to sit at the right hand of the Father. The sun in the northern hemisphere celestially right ascends. That's the way it goes. It goes up and to the right in the northern hemisphere to the eastern sky. And on June 21st, sits at the right side. And there is more sunlight on that day than any other day. And then Christ ends his ministry in the book of Revelation as the Lion of Judah and this trajectory of the sun ends in the sign of the lion, Leo, in August. And that's the way that works. So you have the 12 months and the apparent movement of the sun through each of the signs duplicated in the Bible by the story of the life of Jesus. He becomes, obviously, the sun god. Okay? So in that particular point, on page 859 of your Bible, you'll see the point in which is raised about Aquarius. Because here is wherever Jesus went, you know, he was portrayed as the sign of the fish, Pisces. In fact, they would make, I'm not, oh God, how do you do this? I'm not good at drawing things, but, oh, that's not bad. There's a fish. But they would make a sign and they would write words in there. 
and he was the, the fish, and so he was the age of Pisces. Now, as we've just said here, the, the situation has uh, Aquarius coming 30 days after, de, uh, you know, December after Capricorn, and then Pisces. Pisces coming after. So, but yet here we have the situation on page 859 of the Bible. In Luke 22.10, in which Jesus, they asked Jesus, when will there be the Passover? And he says, well, when you enter into the city, you'll meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house, and he'll show you a large upper room furnished, which is the right hemisphere of the brain. So in that particular point, then, the man with the pitcher of water is Aquarius. So what we're talking there is the Passover uh, from the winter to the spring, but in a whole different way than what takes place in the normal 12-month uh, arrangement where we have, you know, moving into Aries to the springtime. So in this scenario then, Jesus is the sun, the 12 disciples are the 12 signs of the zodiac, the 12 months. Judas is Scorpio or Saturn. He represents the mind that can imprison the spirit and causes the deadening effects on the spirit. And so by the movement of the earth, the sun appears to move into the 12 signs, and the Bible follows the story of Jesus to the letter, astrologically. The Bible and the story of Jesus is actually a month-by-month -month movement in astrology of the apparent movement of the sun. So then if Jesus is the sun moving from Aquarius to Pisces, from John the waterman to select his disciples from the fishermen, how can Jesus then be Pisces the fish pointing to the waterman because the waterman has already come? Let's look at that again. Here he is. He says he steps into the water of the water man, John the Baptist, that's Aquarius. Now here he is, and he's moving to select his disciples from the fishermen, that's Pisces. Aquarius comes first, Pisces comes after Aquarius. So then how could he possibly be Pisces saying, here comes Aquarius? That would have it backwards. The current age that we are in now, which is moving into the age of Aquarius, is dependent on the following. And this is what you have to understand to make this clear. When the vernal equinox takes place, that is the commencement of spring. This is the way this is figured. When the vernal equinox takes place, when spring comes, when the sun crosses the equator, and it happens around March or, or April in that time, one then projects against the backdrop of the traditionally, scientifically, anciently defined constellations. Prior to 60 BC or so, the projection of every spring looking up, you know, at the ecliptic would project to Pisces. Okay? Then during the time of Christ, that Pisces projection or echo. In other words, every month during the spring, during the time of Pisces, when you would look up for 2,000 years or so, it would be up towards that constellation, Pisces. So where the sun is at the first moment of spring depends on the age. And where the sun is now is in Pisces entering into Aquarius. Okay, so it's a different thing. It's not a question of where the sun is month by month by month as, you know, it appears to be in the traditional chart. It is where is it as you look up in the northern hemisphere against the backdrop of the, of the signs, where is it at the spring? And every spring for 2,160 years, when you would look up, it would be at um, Pisces. Yes? Yeah. Uh, just to put it in a slightly different way, the, in the first part, the Earth is rotating. Right. Then the Sun right. rotates. Okay. So the Earth travels this way while the Sun is worked way out. Okay. Turning good. That That's way. a good it's the point. Same thing. Yeah, but it's a, it, it's a good point, and it helps to explain it. It helps to explain the difference there. So that's very good. Now, but let's look at let's look at something for a minute. If you were in Australia, and you do the same thing the first day of spring, 
You could say we're in the age of ergo. It depends on where you are. It depends on where this projection at the first day of spring is coming from. The point being, what makes it non-local is that the ancient projections were based on the position of the sun and the equinox from the northern hemisphere. Because everything was based on the northern hemisphere because the north is the mind. The north is the consciousness. So everything was based around the north. Thus, since Virgo and Leo are not in the position presently in the north, Aquarius is, it is the age of Aquarius and not the age of Virgo or Leo. That's how this, that's how this. So there's two completely different things. And as Albert made it clear, the sun goes one way, the earth goes another way. The traveling through the sun monthly is the traditional thing of Aquarius and then Pisces. But when you get to the traveling of the, uh, uh, of the earth or the sun in a different direction, as Albert was telling us, in the vernal equinox, then you are going to have Pisces coming before Aquarius. So Jesus is saying, I'll be with you to the end of the age. He's talking to the end of the age of Pisces. And then he points, behold, when you see the man with the pitcher of water, you'll have the, par uh, you'll, you'll have the Passover. He's talking of Aquarius. So we have two completely different types of things that are the operation of the stars and the planets. Okay? So that's, that's two ways to read that theory. So we have both sides of Pisces Aquarius theme. Behold the man with the pitcher of water, and after the Aquarian, the return of the fisherman Christ. There are some people, and, I, and I've seen them on the internet, who feel we are still a ways from Aquarius. There's, I've read one fellow who thinks we're about 400 years away from Aquarius. Uh, but I think it's so difficult to measure these types of things, you know, the, the stars and, and, and these constellations are kind of drawn and, you know, they don't really look like, you know, lions or goats or anything like that. But I think that one has to do more than simply measure where the sun or where the earth may be. I think you have to consider the nature of the human mind and why I think most people feel that definitely we have moved into Aquarius are because of the inventions, electricity, the phone, airplanes, television, space travel, computers, satellites, and all of these things are related to Aquarius, and Pisces is related to religion. See. And though they're still making a cry, I mean, religion really is, is fading fast, and it's just betraying itself as, as such, a, such a, an impotent type of force in the world. And this is glaring evidence that Aquarius is upon us. Robert Hand uh, considered Pisces as 221 AD, which would bring the full cusp of Aquarius at 2060. Very interesting. That's not that far away. You know. However, it does appear by the events of change and upheaval in science that we're much closer than that. Whatever. Hopefully, you understand the difference and, and, and how we reach that difference. I wanted to make mention of something else. We talked about, um, and, and I always take a certain amount of, not pride, but I always, you know, it's very important to me that, you know, something come along that kind of proved to you that what you're listening in here, when you come into this room, that what you're hearing is true, to the best of my ability, and because I have to trust science and so forth and so on. But I wanted to make mention that we have been talking for weeks about this, the electrons and how electrons change when you look at them. And so they, the wave function collapse and, and, and they become part of, uh, of, a, of the particle function and meditation and prayer. And what's so interesting is that they just awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. Just 1998 Nobel Prize for Physics. And I'm particularly appreciative of that award since it comes right to the point that we've been sharing here over the past few weeks. What other church, what other church, name me one other church who has been discussing as the realm of God the very things that have resulted in the Nobel Prize being awarded for physics. I'd say we're the only one in the world. But we've been talking about the very thing here that 
has resulted in the Nobel Prize. The 1998 Nobel Prize for Physics went to Robert Loughlin of Stanford University in California, Horst Stormer of Columbia University in New York, and Daniel Tsui of Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. They received the discovery for showing how electrons can change behavior and act more like fluid than particle. Exactly what we've been talking about here. And I think that's extremely significant. We didn't teach this before or after they received the prize. We've been teaching this for weeks, and now the Nobel Prize for Physics is awarded on exactly the subject that's been being taught. So that's significant. And I, you know, I, I, it's just great because it, it's, it's, it should at least encourage you that when you sit here, what you're hearing is scientifically accurate and true, and, and now here you have this Nobel Prize, you see. And the, and the thing here that is so critical as to what they found and, and what you have to understand is that the change happens when you observe. When you look inside of yourself, even though you don't know it, as soon as you do it, you collapse the wave energy inside of yourself to a particle. There are messages that have come down from the universe that are destined for you and you've never gotten them because they've gone right over your head because they're going like a wave in the ocean and they'll never come to you until you watch, until you look, and until that wave energy collapses to a particle so it can find its way through the pineal gland of your brain. And the change involves the subatomic. And all of the things that you've ever heard when you went to church as a child about the spirit is, is actually the subatomic. The spirit is actually the subatomic. Electrons and photons. And these things know where they're going. There are messages that are sent from God to you that know exactly where you are. And yet they have to travel in space as waves over and over and over again until you come to the point where you watch and collapse the wave so then that particle can find its way to the blackboard of your heart and write the message for you. The movement from wave to particle and particle to wave. So we can enjoy the fact that we here were studying a similar activity related to God when these three scientists were rewarded and awarded the Nobel Prize. Now I want to teach, I want to share with you something uh, a little different. And this is something that, you know, you just might want to really think of this. Because it's a whole different approach. And, and when I found this, I said, you know, it makes such sense to me. I want to teach you about a Persian prophet whose name was Mani, M-A-N-I, was from Persia. He was a contemporary of Platonius, who was a, who was a, who was a Greek, Greek scholar. But what Mani tried to do, and I think he's done it, he tried to address the question that if God is so good and so loving and so caring, why is the world filled with such hate? and such violence. What went wrong? How could this be? You know, Jesus loves the little children. God is good. God is love. Our Heavenly Father loves you. And yet all of these horrible things. You know, if you have enough money and, uh, you know, you got a good job and you got, a, you know, intelligence and you can compete in the world, you can really have a good time. But what if you don't? Where is God? The basis of the story seems to go hand in hand with this Nobel Prize uh, that we just discussed because it, it provides an insight that light carries a power which transcends its physical strength. In other words, there's, there's something in this power of light, but anyhow. For Mani, God is light. And this is carried out in the Bible when Jesus says, practice the single eye and your body will fill with light. But Mani felt that God was light and lived in light, but not far away there was another source, and that source was darkness. Today there is light. Tonight there will be darkness. Today it's 
nice and calm. Another day, there'll be darkness and storms. In other words, it's part of the same whole. And in encompassing the, the myth of light versus darkness, Monty made the point that God lives in the light and Satan lives in the darkness. Not saying they're necessarily people, but trying to break down what we live in and why the experience that we have is like it is and why everything is, is, can get so screwed up. Monty said God commands five powers. Intelligence, knowledge, thought, deliberation, and resolution. Let me repeat that. Intelligence, knowledge, thought, deliberation, and resolution. And, and Monty said God uh, commands those powers, and Satan commands five powers, which are smoke, fire, wind, water, and darkness. Smoke, fire, wind, water, and darkness sometimes fought with one another. And they would really rage. And you, you see that sometimes, you know. You can have, you can have the wind and the water and the, you know, screaming and roaring and so forth and so on. But one day as they were struggling in a storm, they looked over and they saw from their dark mass in the distance this kingdom of light. Yeah. Look, what is that? And all the darkness looked at this light and said, Wow! That looks nice. We should have a part in that. We want to be a part of that. So Monty says they wanted to go there. They wanted to have the light. So under Satan, the powers of darkness, smoke, wind, fire, and water, and dark, decided to capture the light and to subdue it. So now Monty makes a very, very interesting point. Monty said, God is no match for the powers of darkness. Mani said, look at God's powers. God is contemplative. God is meditative. God is prayerful. God is quiet. I am on my knees and my hands are folded. Don't make any noise. See? But Satan is full of this furious energy. Boom! Bang! What is going on? Screaming, yelling, fighting, all kinds of things. And yet everyone... God is peace. God is love. God is... And Monty said that God is so meditative, so prayerful, so beautiful, so healing, that God simply cannot fight back. He's passive in the face of evil. He's too innocent. He's too peaceful. He's too loving. And evil rages all over the place. Does it ever tell you? But if you've got a problem in your life and something's going wrong and all hell's breaking loose, what do they say to you? Well, just pray. Just be quiet. Just trust God. And what's he doing? He's a, he's a wimp. He can't do nothing. And yet Satan is throwing everything at you. There's knives flying on one side of your head and the other side of your head. So God ponders, what am I going to do? All hell's breaking loose down there. So God creates a being known as the Mother of Life, which you know is traditionally as the Holy Spirit. She gives birth to what is known as first man. Not a physical, but a spiritual man. And first man gathers his own spiritual powers, not the physical smoke, wind, fire that's going on down in the earth, but the spiritual powers of light, gentle breeze, clear, crisp wind, shining light, cool water, bright fire, and man has these. The elements of first man and God are all set. They're from above. They have no parts of the earth below. And all of these elements come within first man, and they create what is called a soul. That's what Monty says. And God sends them down to save the earth, and here comes first man. But immediately first man is consumed by the powers of darkness on the earth, and he's destroyed and thrown into the deepest pit, and God stands up there. What happened? What happened? And this describes the feeling that all of us get when you try to overcome the negative aspects of life. And though you fight and fight and fight, you just suddenly find yourself seemingly totally destroyed. It's like these people in Wyoming. They have this beautiful son, and then he is just butchered by, how could this be? But anyhow, with the aid of the five powers, God finally succeeds in getting man out of the pit, says Mani. 
But it's not a real victory for God. You know what happens to all of us? Even if we turn things around, even if we feel better about ourselves, for some of the light in first man was taken away and replaced by dark matter. You know, there's always scars from any difficult thing that you go through. So now begins a long time of interaction between God and man and Satan. And what is the whole interaction? It is man's attempt to recover the light that was lost in his encounter with the darkness of the earth. And that's where we're all at now. That's why you're sitting here now. And that's why you meditate. That's why we discuss the functions of light and the angles of light. Our light that entered the fetus at conception has been severely darkened by the system. You came into your mother's womb as a beautiful angle of light from God, pure, holy. And as soon as you got out of your mother's womb and became a human being, it was all destroyed. It was all taken away from you. Your name is this. Your nationality is this. Your religion is this. You'll go to school here. You'll speak this way. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. You must do this. You must do all these other things. And so everything that was of the pure above is gone. And so now you're trying to enter within yourself and recover that light. So God, after the creation, places first man to live in the sun, which means the mind. And this is Jesus, God's only son, the light of the world the mind. And mother of life lives in the moon, which is the emotions. And the cosmos is set in motion around the earth and the constellations of the zodiac serves kind of like spaceships that deliver light to the sun and to the moon and to the earth. And all of these things are going on. So, and here's Monty talking about the zodiac providing light to the mind through the sun and the emotions to the moon. Now the amazing part of the story, which I think Monty outdid himself. A concept that you should ponder very seriously. Satan now makes his move in this battle with God. He must protect his kingdom of darkness. So he makes a man. And he calls the man Adam. Who created Adam? Monty says, Satan the God of darkness. Whew. Because he feels that Adam will be able to store and hold on to the degree of light that Satan has stolen from God. He makes Adam a sexual being. And so since he's made Adam a sexual being, he wants to make sure that he has some way he can control Adam, so he makes Eve. So now he can control Adam through his desires because he can always keep Adam in line by threatening to take Eve away. And Eve and Adam's desires will not allow this to happen, so he will have to do the bidding of God, who Mani says is not the God you've always been praying to. Or maybe it is the God you've always been praying to. So then Satan moves to totally overrun the world. He instructs Adam and Eve... I want you to go forth and multiply. And then I will be all over the place. I will be all, because my spirit of darkness will be in every person all over. And if God of light wants to change this, he'll have to come to each person individually. But, Monty said, if God can get to Adam and Eve before this thing goes too far, he can stop it. Hmm. Eve is alone in the garden. And God, the Heavenly Father, the one of peace, love, compassion, comes and appears as a serpent as a snake and says to Eve, Eve, you've got to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you've got to get Adam to eat as well. Otherwise, there's no thing I can do. But he told us not to eat of that tree. 
because he doesn't want you to understand. But if you'll just eat of it, you'll understand. You'll be filled with light. You'll be filled with knowledge. Whoa. One thing Satan said they could have. They can have anything I've got. But the one thing I don't want you guys going near is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to know the truth. I don't want you to know what's going on. I don't want you to know who I am. And so Eve, as you know the story, goes to Adam, the coiled serpent that rises within each one of us and curls its way up the tree of life, which is the spine, and impacts the pineal gland of the brain, the human body, tells you she must get Adam to eat that fruit. It is the only way that we can be saved out of the snares of the, of the evil one, and so that we understand that the God of the Old Testament is Satan. And Adam finally eats and is expelled from the garden of evil by Satan. So Monty says, Monty says, now they've become like us. They know good and evil. I can't have that. I can't have these people being this way. And he casts them out. They know of life. They, they have knowledge of good. But now the struggle really gets deep and serious. So then Monty suggests something. Who is this God who kills Jesus, who is a symbol of good and peace and love and healing? Who is this God that must torture and have blood flowing to the ground? Who is this? And Monty suggests, who is this abominable God of the Old Testament who rules by fear and will not let anyone touch his fiery mountain lest they be killed? Who is this God who gives these kind of instructions? And when I look at this, if you have a Bible, if you would just turn to page 147 and look at Numbers chapter 31. And in Numbers chapter 31, verse 17. There's a very interesting thing. This is the instructions from God to Moses. And then think of Mani. Mani is saying this God who's given us instructions is the devil. And look what he says. Now therefore, kill every male among the little ones. Kill all the little boys. And kill every woman that has known a man by lying with him, but all the women children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Who is this? And what is the answer that came from Mani? It did not require, Mani never required anyone to worship the fearful God of the Old Testament who Mani decided was Satan himself. Monty said that what is good in each of us is perfectly good and godly good. And this is interesting. Monty was a Persian prophet from thousands of years. He taught that the part of us that sins is something for which we are not responsible. You live in this place. What do you have to do with it? You don't even know. It is not we that sin, we are only vessels that seek to preserve the light that is in us in which the war goes on on the outside. All of this horror that's going on. We say, well, Monty, you know, he's being, you know, what do you mean? He doesn't want to take responsibility for what he's doing. But look at the Bible. Look at page 924 of the Bible. And on page 924 in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 8, it says, verse 7, and we'll be out of here in two minutes. Romans chapter 8, verse 7, it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. How, what are you wasting your time trying to do good? How, what, what, what are you trying to do? It's not possible that your mind can do this. 
Because you're living inside of a foreign object. You're trying to recover the light back to humankind that was stolen by darkness. And yet here you are taking responsibility and all the feelings of guilt and all this for all this lunacy that goes on that you have nothing to do with. Look at this. Look at Romans chapter 7, right above it on the same page, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. For that which I do, I allow not. This is a guy that wrote the Bible. It's a preacher. He says, what I do, I tell other people not to do. It's like Jimmy Swaggart. Oh, you sinners! You're out with these floozies and you're going to hell. And then who knew he put his shower clogs and a bandana around his head and ran down to the motel at night? Who knew? Because why? Because he says, for that which I do, I allow not. I don't allow you to do what I do. But look at verse 15. For what I, for what I would, that's not what I do. In other words, the things that I know I should do, I don't do. But what I hate, that's what I do. But he loves it. He says he hates it, but he really loves it. That's why he does it all the time. What is it that he's doing? But this is the important part. This guy wrote the Bible. And after he got done writing the Bible, he went to the motel. Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, in other words, if I'm doing the things that I know I shouldn't do, and yet I know that the law is good, then verse 17, then it's no more me that's doing it, but the sin that dwells in me that does it. That's the end of that. So don't blame me. I've got to go to the hotel. She's waiting. But it's not me. Remember that. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. Say. But he is not somebody who's, you know, out in the street. This is the guy who wrote the book. This is the same guy who said, ah, oh, abides faith, hope, and love. But after he got done saying that, he's off somewhere and he's having a good time. Say, so, it's not me. <laughs> Remember the guy on television? That devil made me do it. Yeah. Not me. See? So, finally, what does Monty say we should do in this predicament? What are we going to do? There is no way out. You're inside of a body that's going to do whatever it wants to do, regardless of what happens. And your mother and your father and your sister and your brother and your counselor and all these people can say this, and you agree with everybody. You agree. Oh, I, hallelujah, this is right. Yes. Oh, I agree with you. Now, this is what I want you to do. Okay, yeah, I want to do that. Yes, I'm going to do that. Until you get by yourself. And when you get by yourself, you're going to do what you want to do. So this is what Monty says. We cannot fight the system, which Monty calls Satan. And it's true. What you've got to do, get this, is remain passive. We must be still. You've got to stay within. You've got to be at peace. And in doing that, you can be with the one who is peace, who is quiet, who is gentle. And this we do as we observe the light within us. As a watcher, we cause that light to change, to bring us the message, to bring us the... This power of light that comes from above. All the while, the turmoil continues on the outside. Much of it called God. Much of it called religion. And so we learn these things. I, I you know, reach a conclusion. I'm sure that many of you have reached the same conclusion. That this earth, this world, there's nothing in the world you can do about it. Can you, did you ever think that you would live to see the day when religious people would go to a church and picket and scream at people who were mourning somebody who had died? Yes, it's in the paper. I never thought I would see anything like that. So then it's, it's over. It's beyond the point of saying, I can do anything. And, and if I would look, here are people picketing outside of a church, screaming with placards at the people who were being buried in their, all the mourning people, and claiming they're with God. But they are with God. But Monty told us which God they're with. It's the God of darkness. It's the God who says, yes, kill the little boys and take the little girls and have fun with them. Do whatever you want. It's that God. It, 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 and, but now you've learned here from Monty at least a possibility that what this book is talking about in a different way in the realm of, of not Adam, A-T-O-M, but in the realm of personality, that there was the serpent is that energy that rises inside of you in meditation. That's the serpent that spoke to this thing called Eve and said, you've got to eat this thing. You've got to understand. You've got to realize what you're getting involved in. But if you just stay the way you are and you don't realize that there's nothing anything can do to save you. 
And, and, and that is the most beautiful part of the story because it's not something that happened in some primeval garden. It happens inside of every human being today. It is the serpent inside of you that speaks. It is the serpent, that energy that rises like helicon, the helix, the double helix of DNA that rises up the spine to impact the pineal gland. And it's saying to you, you've got to go up the tree, which is your body, and take of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is your mind. You've got to do that because once you then are able to understand these things, then you will be expelled from the garden. Do you know why you're sitting here? You're sitting here because you were expelled from the garden by the God of darkness. You're sitting here because you're no longer welcome. By me. Why are you no longer welcome? Because you think. And you're not allowed to think. And that's this whole story. And I really find much credibility. And when I, I've always wondered, when I've ever read the Bible, you know, and I've tried to say, this is God. And all of the preachers and teachers would tell me, you've got to love God, you've got to have faith. But the whole book I read about, if he wasn't killing kids and women, he's killing animals. He couldn't, he couldn't get enough of having blood sacrifices. He couldn't have enough animals in there to, you know, bleeding all over the place. What the heck is this guy? And, and then the point was, don't come near my mountain. Anybody that touches my mountain is going to die. This is your heavenly father. I don't want to, you know, what is this guy? But now, could this possibly be? And could this possibly indeed be? Well, this was written, and you can look his name, it was written by a Persian prophet many, many years ago who reaches this, this conclusion of, of what, what our life is and what our chances are. And you know yourself, everything that you try and everything that you've attempted to fight against, how do you overcome it? Because as soon as you succeed in putting down one thing that's come against you, there's another one. As soon as you climb one mountain, you get to the top of the mountain, you've overcome, and then what do you look and you see what's ahead of you? Another mountain. And that's all they are, one mountain range after the. And so what this Persian prophet of long ago said, you've got to be exactly the same as the true God. You've got to be passive. You've got to be meditative. You've got to be still. You've got to be quiet. You've got to stay with it because there is nothing else that you can do because you can't win. You can't possibly fight it. You've got to eat from the tree. And many of you, as myself, have for years stood around and I've listened to these these bizarre experiences that people said they've had and what we should do and find it doesn't work. I've got to find a logical explanation. And so now we go into soaring again up to supernova 1987A, up to the, to the movement of, of Pluto uh, uh, taking its place as, as the point of Hades in uh, m March 15th, 1999, and looking at the change. Let me tell you something else and just think about this. What have we talked about here? We've said that Peg we've proved, there's no question about this, that Pegasus is the hippocampus of the brain. The hippocampus of your brain is actually Pegasus. It is in contact with Pegasus, the white horse. And that's where all of the discoveries were made, okay? And what is it talking about? What did we say is going to be the big change that comes upon people in, in, in 99 and 92? It is the restoring of your memory. The restoring of your memory as to who you really are. And now what else is the big thing that's going on in industry all over? What is going to happen in y2, what they call Y2K, year 2000, with the computers is memory. What's going to happen to the memory of the computers when all of a sudden they're faced with zero, zero? What's going to happen? So it's not just a question of memory as it applies to the human brain, Pegasus to Pegasus, Pegasus to Hippocampus. It is memory also in the affairs of man as it applies Y2K to the computer industry. What could happen? And if even half, even a quarter of what they predict could happen, it would be a chaotic situation. That's why this Monty says, what can you do about it? What the heck can you do about it? Nothing. Go off, what are you going to go to Montana and build a, a house under the mountain? You can't. So what do you have to do? You have to do with the only possible thing that you can do, and that is find this place inside of yourself, look inside of yourself, collapse the wave function to a particle, take your instructions from above and carry them out. That's what you have to do. Because otherwise you're just a person sitting on the planet Earth waiting for the whole thing to fall apart. And it will. And so I thought it was very interesting to consider Y2K 
which is the memory of the computer industry in the year 2000 and the collapse there. And then in the year 2000, when the light comes down from supernova 1987A and impacting through the pineal gland of the brain and Pegasus, the white horse, which is the hippocampus of your brain, the restoration of your memory. The restoration of your memory will coincide with the collapse of the computer memory. And what can you do about it? I think there's all these people saying, we've had people have pretty heavy discussions in here, what they're going to do about it. You're going to do nothing about it. There's nothing you can do about it. You're just a grain of sand on the beach. But Monty told you a thousand years ago what you have to do about it. Get inside of yourself, get together with the gentle one, the passive one, and flow above all of this.